Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Laura. I'm Kristen Seavey. And we are here for uh, In Conversation, uh, where we're just talking about um, company, getting to know each other, and things like that. So uh, Kristen and I have known each other for several years. years. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we collaborated in 2017. Um, on other voices. And then when we were starting to build the company up, reached out to Kristen, who is now creative partner and ensemble member. Um, so, I mean, let's just start with uh, what we're doing currently, which is rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very lighthearted romp. Yeah, it always is. At, with <laughs> <us>. <laughs> um so Kristen, just talk a little bit about uh, Becca and the journey that we've been working on so far. Yeah, so Rabbit Hole is basically an exploration of grief, at least that's how I think of it, um, and navigating life after such a tragedy as losing a child, which, you know, personally, I have never, I don't have children, I've never experienced a loss that massive. Um, so, Becca is the mother at the center of the story. She has lost her child, traumatically lost her child um, in an accident. And now it's just kind of trying to find her way back to, she's trying to find her way back to normalcy, which is extremely challenging. Um, and, you know, I've never experienced anything like this. So I've had to kind of connect with it in little ways and find ways that it applies to my life and try to insert that into the character and also just explore really deep parts of myself. <laughs> if that doesn't sound too weird, um, because yeah. this is really grief isn't, it doesn't hold back, you know? So this isn't really a time for me to hold back the work that I'm exploring. So yeah. Yeah. Um, have you played roles on the level of Becca before? Not on grief, not on this level of grief. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I've explored characters before that have gone deep in one direction, but not um, for grief. So this is this is new territory for me. Okay. Um, what did you know about Rabbit Hole? Uh, prior to us working on it? I read it in school. I remember, um, you know, like the first five years after it came out, it was kind of like a hot play. You know, everybody right. was doing it in scenes. Everybody was, you know, reading it and talking about it because it won a Pulitzer. And I think it's in its own way, it's kind of a groundbreaking play. So I'd read it. But, you know, when I was 18 I can I mean even now like there are parts of it that like I can't ever relate to like I can't relate to losing a child um but when you're 18 you can't really grasp those kinds of concepts so I think that it's a little bit silly that like 18 year olds are working on this level <laughs> of like, grief in the sense that it's like you know not the grief of a loss of a relationship but the grief of like losing a child yeah. when like that's not anything that an 18 year old, most 18 year olds have ever really experienced. So I think revisiting it as an adult and reading it and exploring it um, just really gave me a different perspective and a more deeper understanding of what the writing is talking about. Okay, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I read it, um, I saw it first actually in 2006. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was then so yeah it was my first show I think um outside of a musical with Cynthia Nixon um who played Becca and Time Daly who played Nat um and it, yeah it was a beautiful production um and then after and then I reread it I think in quarantine before we decided to do it and uh it's just I mean it's just an effortless read mm-hmm yeah, the writing, it's one of those pieces where like, if you do get to work on it, you know, it's, you're lucky to be able to work on something that um, explores humanity in the way that it does. Like, it makes sense that it won a Pulitzer. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so talk a little bit about um, just kind of your journey with the company. Um, and that could even be before we started to, before we started this version. Yeah, so like you mentioned earlier, um, I started working with you in 2017, um, doing original monologues and stuff like that. And then when quarantine hit, I saw that you were doing such great work and I showed up and tried to be supportive because nobody else was really doing quarantine readings of stuff. And, and you, were you know, every show. you were, uh, you were really I mean, supportive. I tried to, you know, show up and watch stuff. And, you know, I mean, there's also not in the beginning, there wasn't really much for me to do, too. So I'm like, how wonderful is it that people are offering this kind of stuff for free for people to watch and enjoy? Um, so I really enjoyed, you know, seeing the company and kind of getting to know them through the characters that they were playing and you know you came to me at the right time to add me in i mean it was it literally could not have been better timing it was um exactly what i needed right then so i think it's a little bit of kismet that it came together the way it did and yeah i've just i've been really grateful to be able to tap back into acting because i guess my quarantine journey I've been self taping and I've been doing stuff and it's still there, but I haven't been like as actively pursuing it. So it's yeah. a nice way to be like, Oh yeah, I am an actor and this is what I want to do and um, continue to explore roles and ratings and work and workshops with like-minded people who also want to do that has just been a really good experience. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been, um, it's been really fun. Um, I mean, the first production you came in on was Streetcar? Streetcar. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then prog I think the only month um, you haven't worked on something so far would have been January, right? Since then. Yeah. Yeah, January. Yeah. So... It's been a, been a fruitful, fruitful several months. Totally. I mean, I never thought that I would work on Rabbit Hole. You know, it's also not a play that you see being produced very often, which is kind of right. odd to me. Um, maybe because it is such a heavy play mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's hard. I think sometimes there's art that like you escape with, and then there's art that kind of shows other aspects of humanity. And I feel like choosing a play about navigating the loss of a child in such a time where there's a lot of stuff happening in the world is, um, I don't know, maybe some people just want to escape. So that's why it doesn't get produced as much, but it's still, you know, incredible work as an actor to, to work on. Yeah, I also think sometimes the interest changes after it's been made into a film, things like that, where that becomes more accessible. Yeah, because, um, you know, why put it on when you can just go on Amazon and watch it? Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm not a big fan of the film, um, only because it's very different. Um, mm -hmm. I think the film is like its, its own, um, but it is a... Um, it deals with humor a lot less, and I think the play worked because of um, how it lent humor to grief. I have not seen it. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic cast. I mean, it's Nicole Kidman and Aaron Eckhart and Diane Weist. So, I mean, it's it's gorgeous, but it's just mm -hmm. very different. Which yeah. tends to, I mean, it's just the equivalent of a book being turned into a movie. Did um, David Lindsay Abair work on it? Yeah, he wrote it. He okay. Adapted. I wonder what that's like as a writer adapting something that, you know, you've created for a certain medium and then adapting it for film and having to make choices to change stuff. Yeah, I think he talked a lot about how he opened it up. Um, a lot of, there are so many characters in the film, like hmm. how he's there. Uh, is shown um, the people at the uh, group. Debbie is in the film. 
Um, there's even flashbacks to Danny. Um, so it, it plays with it in a very, very different way. But I think effectively in, uh, in the use of like, you know, they show the videotape. Right. So that's, that's pretty effective. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a, a more visual medium in that right. you're able to show a lot more things than you can on a stage. But then again, I think that the simplicity of the dialogue and the relationships that come through with the dialogue um, is really where this play shines, that it's less of, you know, sh not really showing or necessarily telling, but through the dialogue and the relationships, I feel like the the story comes through a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the movie has been spoken about being just about Becca and Howie, where the play is about the ensemble's grief. Mm -hmm. um, so that Ever? changes. What? And different versions of grief, you know, like yeah. a child's death doesn't just affect the parents. It does affect the other characters in the play. Everybody's just experiencing it differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in terms of you're in Maine right now. I am. And... You were there from the beginning of quarantine? Or no, I came up here in May. I was actually, I was in New York at my apartment in like the really rough months, like March and April, mm -hmm. and then in May. And for the summer, it was just kind of like, you know, like I'm with my boyfriend and he teaches dance. So there's just more space here for like me to come in here and do something. And while he's in the other room also doing it at the same time, uh, my apartment just doesn't allow for that space. And it just got really crowded really fast. And I personally, I wasn't able to find room for me to be productive and creative because I just felt so cramped. Um, sure. and, you know, we had to schedule around each other which was also hard because of the space, you know, it's like, okay, well, I need the living room to be quiet here. So you can't schedule a lesson and vice versa, but it just got a little bit too hard. And then sitting in my apartment 24 seven, whereas here in the summer, I could step outside, I could go for a walk. I mean, I sure. you can go for a walk in New York too, but. Yeah, but not in March and April last year. No, not really. <laughs> so it's, it's been nice to kind of step away. I mean, I know that I won't be here forever, but right. it's nice to just kind of step away because um, there, there were a lot of things that I think needed to change with just like, you know, my work habits and mm -hmm. kind of just like evaluate what I actually want. And I feel like that's kind of a blessing in disguise for a lot of people in quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was some transition. I can't believe we're over a year now. I know I'm, I'm like thinking back to last year and it's like weirdly nostalgic, but not nostalgic. Like nostalgic isn't really the right word, right. but I'm just, it took me a while to get used to because I'm just so used to going, going, going like jam packed schedule all day, every day. And it was really hard for me to adjust to like, what do I do? I have this open-ended amount of time and I don't have anywhere to be and I can't really go anywhere. Um, and I, that was the hardest part for me to get used to is to like adjusting to this new normal and being productive for myself and finding stuff that fulfilled me at the same time. Yeah. Sustaining that productivity. Sustaining. So in this, um, I guess this quarantine version of the company, like, do you feel like you could have done more during quarantine or do you feel like this is exactly what if you had in the like grand scheme of if you had a pandemic fall on you and you had to adapt to those changes do you feel like this is the dream version of a quarantine dream team <laughs> or do you feel like there's room where you're like oh if i could go back i would have mm. done this or this instead yeah it's interesting um none of this once the pandemic hit, we were in, we were still in production on a play. Um, so we were like, yeah, of course, like we'll do it in May and then July and then October. And then 
September rolled around and we're like, we're, we're not doing this anymore. So we started doing the reads privately in April of last year. And then our first read went live in May. And originally it was just because the company was very small. It was like four people. Um, we just wanted people to start getting to know the actors in the play uh, in different roles. And then, and then I started thinking about what I really wanted and what I really wanted was a repertory company. Um, something that's very, very difficult to really find actors that wanna be a part of. Um, because a lot of actors, particularly film actors, just want to go from you know one role to the other. They don't wanna be tied down to anything. Um, so it's hard to find actors who wanna be part of something bigger. Um, and, and that was where, where it really started. Um, and then we started doing one play a month and then two plays a month. And then this year we went to three and started doing the web series. Um, but I don't know if there's so much more we could have done. What mm -hmm. I do wish though, is that some of the stuff that I was doing later in the year, I had known about earlier, like StreamYard, um, like uh, transitional work with uh, the plays. Um, yeah, just a couple of different things that I think would have made a difference to the earlier products. Um, but I don't think it would have changed like what we were doing. It would have just changed the outcome. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, you know, nobody has ever experienced anything like this. Um, and it is wild to think that, you know, I remember getting the notice like, oh, we're going to shut down work for two weeks mm -hmm. and being like, holy cow, what am I going to do for two weeks? Right. And then it kept getting pushed back and kept getting pushed back. And you're like, okay. So now I feel like on the other end, it's going to be a little bit weird getting back to normal. Like the idea of sitting on a crowded train with like 60 people is so like spatially weird. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's Broadway alone. I mean, I wasn't, I think the last show was like March 13th of 2020. Um, and that was when my work also told me like, we don't know how long we're going to be out. Um, and then in April, they were talking about us coming back. Um, and then, you know, nothing. And I think the longer it went on, the longer it became like, okay, I, I don't think this is going to be as soon as we think. Um, so how can we, how can we adapt to that? And I mean, cause I gotta tell you a lot of my artist friends did not want to adapt to it. They chose not to, they said, I'm, I'm done if this is how it has to be done. And when, when things come back, then um, then I'll be back. Um, I didn't feel that way. And I was lucky to find people who didn't as well. Yeah. I, I remember in the beginning too, there was this like pressure of like, well, you know, you're never going to have this time again. So what are you going to do with it? Oh um, yeah. There was a lot of that pressure of write your right King Lear. Yeah. And I just find that so and it definitely affected me, especially because I was in such a weird space of like, I, I I have all of these ideas of things that theoretically, if I was given this time, I want to do, but I don't know how to do any of them. I don't even know how to like get out of bed and be like, okay, I'm going to do these three little small tasks and like, you know, have a productive day. So like the idea of, you know, writing King Lear, <laughs> is like, oh, I should be doing that, but I don't know how to do that, even though I do know how to do that, if that makes right. sense. Yeah, I, I think that was a big part of the depression early on for people as well, particularly artists was, you know, people who are working nine to five or whatever the hours are consistently, they always are saying, well, I just don't have the time to do that. Um, and then when they are put, but again, I think what people uh, were struggling with was, the pandemic added its own 
factor to it. It's not yeah. like you were given a million dollars and are like, I still don't have the time. Like exactly. you were taken away from your family. You were taken away from your friends. You can't have human contact. Like it, it saps creativity on another level. Yeah. And then there's like this expectation of like, well, you know, if you don't use this time, like you're never going to get it again. Oh, yeah. And um, I just, I feel like that was just an immense pressure, but now I feel like I've definitely found a better groove where I can wake up and I know exactly what I need to do or what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of people have found a lot of creativity and productivity and um, yeah. And also like adapted to like classes and stuff like that, you know, like mm -hmm. I know that there's tons of virtual classes that are being offered in lieu of in-person. I don't feel like that's ever going to change. I feel like that's going to be a new offering. Yeah, I think a lot of stuff is not going to change now that we found it. A lot of offices aren't going to open again um, because of how they found ways to work at home. Yeah, and it's also you know so much cheaper than like let's say a casting office renting out a ten thousand dollar a month studio. Right. You know now they just go rent you know for five hundred bucks a day a studio for the whole day or something. Yeah. But um, you know on the level of like classes you had the idea to like work on workshop type stuff with all of the actors in the company, which I think is such a cool idea. Um, and it's something that I really enjoy too. And yeah, just like what gave you that idea to want to like start a monthly workshop with people in the company? Um, well, it's something that I always wanted to do. Um, never really thought I would have uh, a company to do it with at this level. Um, and then I started reading a little more into the group theater, which is something that inspired me and Steppenwolf um, and found that their growth as a company came from their growth as a group um, and not just projects, not just people saying, yeah, I, I watched you in, in that and it was great, um, but learning and growing and, and also not just growing, but also staying stagnant together and understanding what we need to grow. Um, there's a story I heard uh, when the TV show Friends uh, shot uh, their pilot in a couple of episodes. Obviously, no one knew who they were. Um, and they would sit around with each other. <laughs> and it takes certain kinds of artists to be able to do that. But they, they all watched the episode. Um, at like a loft in New York. And each one of them pointed out um, false notes and the things they didn't like about each other's performances mm -hmm. so they could grow. Um, and, and it's just, if they didn't do that, and again, there were times where that can be hurtful <laughs> uh, to point out and actually, you know, especially when you're on television. Um, but it, it helped them trust each other as a group. Um, and that's what I wanted was um, to go back to basics, to learn from each other and watch each other and give feedback and uh, grow as a group. Yeah, well, I often feel like, you know, when you work on stuff that you're working towards a goal, but it's not an internal goal. It's more of an external goal. It's like, I'm working on this play so that I can present it to people so that they can see it so that they can tell me I'm good. Right. And like doing a workshop just, or like taking a class. I mean, I know that people constantly tell you like be in class, take classes, keep mm -hmm. working on your craft, that kind of stuff. But sometimes I wonder how many people actually do that? Or if they're just like, well, you know, I went to conservatory, I know what I'm doing. Um, yeah, but I feel um, like I don't know how many people, it's a really great question because also on the other end, classes are expensive. They um, are. To maintain, depending on even who you go to. Um, and sometimes they're hard. I mean, I think they're easier now with scheduling. Um, but I know they're they're very hard to um, work into a schedule um, that frequently. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I would have to, you know, not go to class sometimes because it's like, okay, well, do I want to go to class that I'm paying for every week or do I want to say no to a $200 paycheck? 
stuff like that. It's like, I don't want to do this other job, but like, I kind of have to. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, just the, the ongoing expense of classes too, because like, you can't just, I hate the idea of, and I'm, I'm a dancer. So I see this on a lot of dance workshops. There'll be like a workshop weekend or, you know, a master class, which is not a master class. It's like a higher level class. And it'll say the phrase like level up your dancing. And I'm like, there's no such thing as you're not going to take one class and then just all of a sudden become Meryl Streep. Like it doesn't work that way. Like you have to put in the time and the hours and you know, there's such immense pressure in 2020, 2021 that, you know, like paying for your bills, maintaining a job, pursuing right. your career on the side. If you're a normal person like me and you don't have, you know, a hedge fund, trust fund paying for your rent. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think training is important. I think the consistency of training is important, but I don't think you always need to be in class to be training. Right. Um, I think you can be reading. Reading is training constantly. Um, and and I don't say this because I run this company, but I really do feel like being part of a community is training by getting to do work frequently, by getting to work with different people. Um, and there are some shows, you know, that we do that are like Rabbit Hole, that are Pulitzer Prize, and a lot of actors want to do them. And then there are other shows um, that actors like being part of, but they also use to, uh, train with. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, just having, having that support system is really important. Um, but the main reason going back to that, that I started the workshop is for the work that we do as a company, because most of the time, which I'm sure you've had, is when you have a workshop or an acting class, your acting teacher will say, okay, well, this is this is good, but just so you know, the director might say this, and then this is what should happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to eliminate that since I'm the person who's also directing most frequently, that it's just coming from one source. Um, so anything that we do and work on in the workshop is stuff that is immediately applicable um, because we're also, you know, going for that vision as a company, as opposed to then going to another director and saying, like, you're not going to say to another director, well, my acting teacher told me to do this. Right. And, um, so it kind of eliminates that and allows the freedom of what we work on to be immediately applicable, which I think is really helpful. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a certain malleability and like learning to figure out what works for you, but to funnel through so that you achieve what the overall idea of the director or the production is. Right. And, you know, I, I know that I really appreciate like a collaborative effort. Um, and I also appreciate like the humility aspect of coming together, like that friend story that you mentioned of like, all right, let's, give each other constructive criticism, not because we want to tear somebody down, but because we want them to grow and we want to grow. And it's like, I don't know, there's just, there's no like shame or pride. And cause there's just no room for ego in any of this. Like that is, yeah. And that is the biggest thing I talked to a Rand about, uh, my partner and is it's not just about bringing in actors with talent it's about bringing in actors without ego which is not always the easiest find um because it's not that actors are self-centered and i know that a lot of people think that but it's more that um actors sometimes feel like they have to put up a wall um because there's so much competition um And if I let this down and I say, listen, I don't know how to do this or, you know, whatever it is, then, um, then it's looked at as a weakness. And, and I think what we promote in the company, most of all is the vulnerability of being yourself. And Mm -hmm. you don't know something 
we can talk about it. And if you do know something, then you should be able to share that without someone thinking you're telling them how to do it. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting balance to try to find that over this year. It's honestly like, this sounds so ju juvenile to say, but like, it's hard to be yourself freely in a world that is really being filtered through a lens more and more every day. Yeah. You know, like you look at Instagram and sometimes I'll see someone's profile and they'll have like, just on like an even simpler level, not even acting work, just like being a person, you know, you open up Instagram and you see someone's profile and it has like 30,000 followers and every post is getting like, I don't know, like a thousand likes, but then you look at them and you see that they're all fake and you see yeah. that all the likes are fake and you see that all the followers are fake and you see that like, there's this, this filter, but yet like, I know that it's fake. I know that that's not real, but then like I, you know, I'll scroll through the photos and I'll be like, Oh man, why doesn't my skin look like that? Why, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's, I feel like those things affect us as artists to be like, Oh, well you don't want to be to this or you don't want to be to that, or you don't want to come across as to this. Yeah, so and then It all gets buttoned up and opening it up and really sharing that, you know, just like rabbit hole, like sharing that like deep grief that like, I don't share it with anybody, you know, like the, the rock bottom experiences of my life. I don't put them on display for people, but that's what's being required of me is to try to access those things, which is really hard when you want to show everybody the highlights of your life. Yes. Yes. I Absolutely. And it's getting, I mean, quarantine was some of the worst of it um, because there was so much time on your hands and you got to revisit, you know, the year that passed and other people who had, you know, better yeah. years. And, you know, and I, I also, you know, I will say like a good majority of the company is not very, um, I mean, they're not posting seven times a day. Um, and, and I think there's a healthy balance to how you handle social media as well. Um, we, there's, there's a difference between like not putting yourself out there at all versus, you know, um, watching what other people post and learning from it. Um, and, but, you know, the industry is just very much about saturation. For sure. Um, I like that you mentioned learning because I feel like that's something that I try to just remind myself, like never be too closed off to want to learn or be open, like always be open to learning and, you know, being a student, even if you are the one that's like in the expert position or, I There's mean, yeah. expert, but like, you know, you're always going to have either somebody who knows more or somebody who knows less than you in the room. But yep. like, why not just everybody be like that status kind of not be there, you know? That wasn't very cohesive, but you know what I meant. No, no, I do know what you mean. I do. And I mean, everything, you know, no matter who we work with, I mean, I I want everything to continue to be equal. You know, I don't, I'm not creating in the company a hierarchy of even people who have been here, you know, four or five, six years. You know, we all still work on the same stuff. We still rotate. We still support. Um, it's it's not meant to be a company of this is this is our star vehicle, and then this is this. You know, and mm -hmm. it, it gets harder the more company members you have um, to do that. You know, I we can't go up to doing like ten plays a month, so everyone has you know a leading role, um, but everyone. What I love is like everyone is really supportive mm -hmm. of like, you know, I, I'm cool to sit this month out so they get the lead. Um, yeah. I also love that, um, you know, that people are willing to share the spotlight and also to like share roles. You know, I'm sure that there have been plays that have been done within the company where somebody is like, oh man, I really want to do that role. But then yeah. like somebody else gets cast and they're like, oh, I really wish I got that, but I really love that she or he is cast. Like they're going to do great. Yeah, absolutely. It's not all about like, 
you and when is it my turn? It's like, you know, I mean, it is a little bit more equal support, which, and it's genuine too, which is what I love. It's not like, I'm going to pretend to be happy for this person right. yeah. who has the role that I really want. And then I'm going to try to trip them on the way down the stairs. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I mean that, yeah, that's where I feel luckiest is everyone is, uh, is humble and they want to be here. Um, and they want to be here not just for the work, but for each other. Um, I, feel, I feel too like everyone is really open to like, if there is a moment where your ego is getting the best of you, because let's be honest, you know, egos creep in and you just have to check them and nobody is perfect. But I feel like it's a company where if somebody was like, hey, that wasn't cool or like, hey, you might want to like, you know, reel it back a little bit that it would be taken if it's done well, it would be taken well of like, oh, yes, I recognize that. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to come across as that. Yeah, absolutely. I also think a lot of people, especially because the majority of the company is actors, they also understand that. And I think a lot of people are less about being confrontational about it and more about understanding, well, I think like that was just today. You know, I yeah. think that, that was just in the moment. And, you know, and I feel like a, a lot of times it's like if someone, if you feel someone is, in, is insulting you, like you feel like I have to say something, but the more you become, I mean, it's like with your family, like if your father's having a bad day or something, you're not going to be like, listen, that was really rude. You're going to be right. like, oh, dad's pissed off. Like, <laughs> right. Um, and I think that becomes more with the familiarity of what we work with is like, okay, I mean, and when you're working with 20 people, you know, on average, you know, people have more bad days than, than most. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, very excited for all that we have coming up. Rabbit Hole is Saturday the 24th uh, at 2 p.m. on Broadway On Demand. And... And then we got a lot of nice stuff coming up. Um, we have uh, Rand's web series uh, live the next day uh, as a reading. And then we're doing Steel, Steel Magnolias next month. And then we're rolling out a new schedule to see uh, what's keeping us in quarantine. So, All right. Very, very exciting. All right. Well, I will uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, yep. Everyone well else? Everyone else, visit our website, uh, check up on the work, and come see uh, Kristen in uh, Rabbit Hole. Yay. All right. See you soon. Bye. Bye.